Good afternoon, everyone. We apologize for the slight delay in starting the program. Geshe Kutin Jinbala is a Tibetan Buddhist scholar and an academic of religious studies and both Eastern and Western philosophy. He has been the principal English translator to His Holiness the Dalai Lama since 1985. He has translated and edited more than 10 books by the Dalai Lama, including the world of Tibetan Buddhism, A Good Heart, A Buddhist Perspective on the Teachings of Jesus, and the New York Times bestseller, Ethics for the New Millennium. Geshe received his early education and training at Songkhwa Chirde Monastery in Hongsur, near Mysore, South India and later joined the Sharte College of Grande Monastic University in Mongol, South India, where he received the Geshe Palami degree. He taught Buddhist epistemology, metaphysics, middle way philosophy, and Buddhist psychology at Gandhi for five years. Geshe also holds a BA honors degree in Western philosophy and a PhD degree in religious studies, both from Cambridge University. From 1996 to 1999, he was a Margaret Smith Research Fellow in Eastern Religion at Burton College, Cambridge, and he has now established the Institute of Tibetan Classics, where he is both President and Editor-in-Chief of the Institute's translation series, Classic in Tibet. He is also a member of the Advisory Board of the Mind and Life Institute, dedicated to fostering creative dialogue between the Buddhist tradition and Western science. He is a visiting scholar, research scholar at Stanford Institute of Neuroinnovation and Translational Neurosciences at Stanford University. Geshe has written many books and articles. His latest work are Tibetan Songs of Spiritual Experience and Self, Reality and Reason in Tibetan Thought, Songkhapa's Quest for the Middle Way. I'll read a short bio of Professor Matthew King. Professor Matthew King is Professor of Transna Transnational Buddhism at the University of California, Riverside. He specializes in Inner Asian Buddhism with a special focus on the Tibet Mongol interface during the Yuan and Qing periods. He has published widely on the history of Buddhist scholasticism, medicine, institution building, and political theory in the region. He has also explored the history of inner Asian Buddhist interactions with circulating intellectual traditions during the 19th century, including Qing models of world history, as well as European national philosophy and humanism, biomedicine, nationalism, state socialism, and Buddhist studies. He is the author of three books. The first, Ocean of Milk, Ocean of Blood, a Mongolian monk in the ruins of the Qing Empire, won several awards, including the American Academy of Religions 2020 Award for Best Book in Textual Study. His second book was In the Forest of the Blind, The Eurasian Journey of Washington's Record of Buddhist Kingdoms. He has a forthcoming annotated translation and study of Anishab's famous 17th century history, The Precious Treasury, co-authored with Kempo Kungala to be published with Wisdom Publications in 2024. He's currently working on two major projects. The first focus on Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, philosophical critiques of the brain sciences and the shadow of the mind, mind and life dialogues. The second is an environmental history of Buddhism and science in the Gobi Desert. Welcome, Professor Matthew King. Uh, Professor Sarah Richardson is a historian of the arts and religions of South Asia with a specialization in Buddhist visual and material practice, especially in Himalayan painting. Professor Richardson is an assistant professor of teaching stream in the history of religions for the Department of Historical Studies at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. She especially enjoys teaching and learning about the ways that the arts are used in religious contexts 
and how the art moved and moved people helped and helped to build communities. She is a passionate about finding ways to help students experience and learn through the arts in her courses. In 2020, she was awarded the UTM Teaching Excellence Award for Sessional Instructors. Professor Richardson is currently working on a book-length study about visual worlds in Tibetan architecture, which is an in-depth study of the rich program of inscribed murals at an important 14th century Tibetan Buddhist monastery called Shalom. Mural paintings, Sarah argues, were then and are still useful in larger cultural projects of Tibetan Buddhist knowledge production and social communication. She also extends her scholarly practice to the museum and has researched for years the largely unpublished Tibetan paintings collection at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Um, next, we have Professor Sutter Richardson, who is the discussion moderator, to explain the moderated segment of this event. All right, thank you very much. My name is Sarah Richardson, and I am so honored to be here with you to celebrate and learn more about the contributions of the great Sakya Pandita today. Um, so today we are gathered here to celebrate the 772nd anniversary of Jangwon Lama Sakya Pandita Kurva Gyaltsen. And we're today remembering and celebrating events that took place in the 13th century, in and around 1251. I love imagining the world of Tibet in the 13th century, for I see this moment in history as one where Tibet really came into its own special forms of power in a global arena. Of course, this was in the face of the potential and very real Mongol invasions, but in response to this threat of war, Tibetan society and religion framed itself as a solution, as a solution with incredible success. Today we will hear about the historical and religious impacts left by the great leader and monk, Sakya Pandita. So, of course, as an art historian, the first thing I did was look up old images of him. Um, in his iconography, uh, we have, of course, very little that survives from the 13th century when he lived. But from about the 15th century on, we have some sculptures and paintings. He's shown as a monk wearing a red Pandita hat or in sculpture, also sometimes shown with an Ushmisha, and with his attributes, the sword and the book. Of course, identifying him can be quite difficult, since in sculpture, if we can't see the red of the hat, he can very easily look a lot like another great leader, Tsongkhapa. Nevertheless, we can find some historic images of him in collections throughout the world. So, I am here as the moderator, which means that I will be doing a job of keeping some time, although I realize I've left my phone somewhere, so I don't actually have a watch. So maybe I can get some help keeping the time. But what we are going to do is have three speakers give us lectures, and then at the end of that time, we will have time for questions. And we are trying to have a dialogue here, so please keep note of your own questions, and if you have any, please raise your hands at the end. We're also happy to have received some questions ahead of time from our online communities, so we will be reading some of those. So it is my own great pleasure and honor to welcome His Holiness, the 42nd Sakya Tritin Ratna Vajra Rinpoche, to deliver the first lecture today which is on the key contributions and influence of Jangwan Lama Sakya Pandita on Sutra and Tantra in Tibetan Buddhism. Thank 
the lineage of the Sankhapitas uh, or a nation. And of course, Sankhapitas' contribution to major sciences such as the grammar, poetic, of course, this is well known. So, for example, the Dalai Lama in his, in his history of Tibet actually says that when it comes to the development and flourishing of the ten five major sciences and five uh, minor sciences in Tibet, we all have to support with that. To him, we all great step. So, secondly, the Dalai explicitly states that. And second, was not only a lawyer scholar, but also he was an expert in crafts, arts and crafts. For example, the Samye monastery was a, a very famous uh, uh, a wall uh, painting of Manjushri, which was uh, in Tampas as a And then these days we are all familiar with this particular art form called Dr. Tampa, which is a kind of a, a plant with two uh, birds with two headed ones with the uh, scripture and, 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 the, and the sword that we are all exposed to the Sajapandita who invented that. So Sajapandita is a contribution to a uh, Tibetan tradition in general uh, in, uh, in the Vinaya and others in Tantra as well uh, is very well known. So uh, you know from all of these point of view and for, also in, in the case of epistemology logic, Ramana and Tema, and Sakyapadita is well known to have you know, produced a new and revised translation of the famous text from Ramana by Tama Kirti. So the fact that Sakyapadita actually revised the translation is credited in the, in the core of the major versions of this text. Uh, we will see that and in his own uh, based on Ramana Bhatika and Ramana Samuja Dignal, and Tamado and Tamadevi, Sajapandita composed his own original work, the Tamadevi, Treasure of Wisdom, which has the rare uh, uh, exception or example of being the only Tibetan text that was translated back into Sanskrit. All the other texts were translated from Sanskrit to Tibetan, but Tamadevi was of such high standing, with such kind of, you know, uh, Esteem on the part of the Indian Panditas, it was felt the need to be translated back into Sanskrit. So this is so this is Sakya Pandita. So in in brief, uh, Sakya Pandita's contribution to uh, to that knowledge science fields, the ten the five major sciences and five minor sciences, as well as the Vinaya, Sutra and Tantra is extensive. So uh, uh, his holiness concluded by saying that uh, the conclusion conclusion here is while acknowledging the major contributions of Sakya Pandita, we ourselves, the uh, Buddhists, you know, we are now at a time when internationally there are members of the other communities who are taking interest in Tibetan culture, in particular Buddhist insights and Buddhist teachings. We ourselves, the Buddhist tradition, the Tibetan tradition is like our family heritage. We need to appreciate our family heritage and really treasure it so that we don't be really sure that this tradition survives for a long time to come. And uh, at the end, he prays for the long life of his own So it's a very good translation. Master, 
and second computer <coughs> actually uh, as Sakatatan Buddha said that he was a genius, he was actually a child genius and it would be no exaggeration to say that in the entire history of the Tibetan people, probably, most probably, Sakya Pandita was the most brilliant mind. This is a, not an exaggeration. And Sakya Pandita was, you know, as Sakya Pandita said that he was, uh, you know, he, he had his, in his uncle, Jesu Tapakyalsan, a great teacher. And Jesu Tapakyalsan and Sakya Pandita's relationship was very close. And Jesu Tapakyalsan, while a great spiritual teacher, was also very ecumenical. He even wrote a short history to that. So he was not just a great spiritual master, but also quite ecumenical in his interest. And Jesu Tapakyalsan already seemed to have introduced Sakya Pandita to the basics of you know, uh, Sanskrit studies. If, for example, if you look at Sajjad Pandita's biography, Sajjad Pandita was exposed to Panchatantra. Panchatantra to this day have not been translated into Tibetan. So which means Sajjad Pandita was studying as Panchatantra in Sanskrit. So one thing that was true is that 40 years ago, something happened at the beginning of the 13th century which really completely changed the course of the life of Sakya Pandita and for that matter, for the Tibetan tradition as well. So in 2004, 2004, uh, the Kashmiri Pandit Shakti Bhatra arrived in Tibet at the invitation of Trukul Ozawa. Shakti Sri Bhatra was accompanied by nine other Indian Pandits, Nepalese Indian Pandits. And among them was Sugata Shiri and Sangha Shiri. And in 1205, when Chagishri Bhadra was invited to Central Tibet, Sakya Pandita personally invited Sugata Shiri to Sakya as his tutor. And Sugata Shiri was in Sakya for over two years, during which Sakya Pandita studied Sanskrit, logic, epistemology, and, and a whole bunch of stuff. By the time the Indian master Shakyamuni was leaving Tibet, by then Sakya Pandita was already a great scholar. His first text, one of his earliest texts, is in fact a treatise on music based on the Indian Natya Shastra, Rumipitri. And I'll just read one simple verse and you can get a flavor of what kind of brilliant mind. Imagine this is 20, early 20s, he's writing this. He says, for the devout, music is an offering. For the better, music is a source of livelihood. For, the, for those who are sensual, music is what gives pleasure to their heart. I just imagine. So in Tibetan, it says, Te de na ni chuba, te de na ni chua, chua, cha de na ni yu, te de na ni kya chua. So he's right at the beginning, when he's talking about the virtues of music, you can vividly get a sense of this author who is talking about the multiple role music can play for the devout as an offering like the Indians who chant, and for the beggar who is playing a lute, it's a source of living, making a life. And then for those who are sexual, music is what gives joys. So this is one of the very early texts such as the role, and already you can see of the great, subject, uh, great uh, Sanskrit masters on him. So what he is, what we see here is a brilliant mind who sees the sophistication of the Indian international tradition, Sanskrit tradition, and the Indian artistic tradition, and he wants to replicate it in Tibet for the Tibetan people. So it's as simple as that. So,
if you have such a lesson, in my generation, each one of us, we all need at least few verses from second by heart. So if we as our as parents of my generation, if we are not able to transmit this to our children, and if our children don't know second, we have not done our job. It's as simple as that. Okay? So I'm just being very blunt here. So this should not. So, such a, but did the major contributions are of course in this other text called uh, Kenju. And Kenju was written towards the end of his life, and this is what really shaped the entire Tibetan intellectual tradition. It is a quite a, not a very long text. There are three chapters: one on composition, Tsongma. Second chapter on exposition, Sheva or Sheva, and third on the Delta or Tsuba, dialectics in Tibet. Okay, so, and this is known in Tibetan as Kebe Chawa a threefold person of a learned person. So, if you want to be a learned person, if you want to be a scholar, you are supposed to have mastery on these three fields to be able to teach others, to be able to write books and to be able to and engage in dialects, dialectics and debate with others. So this text really maps out, you know, his holiness Sagittarius talked about establishing the tradition of five major fields and five minor fields. This is the text that established that tradition. And from that point onwards, the Tibetan intellectual tradition was never the same. So it is in the first chapter of the composition where Sajipadita introduces the Sanskrit poetics for the first time in Tibet. Until Sajipadita's time, there were translations of poetic, poetry text, but poetics as a discipline was never established. Of course, Tibetans, we have our own native poetry, which is natural poetry. So if you look at Milarepa's songs of spiritual experience or you know, Katamalepa, Book of Qatar. There are poet, poetic verses, but poetry and poetics was never formalized as an intellectual, you know, literary discipline. So in particular, with this chapter, really he introduced the Indian Kavya tradition, you know, by citing extensively from Ajara Dhanti's Kavitash, Neural Poetry, and in this chapter, he really explained and formalized the poetic tradition of Tibet. And one very important fact of Sahibhadita's approach is that he was never keen on simply copying because he knew Sanskrit is a very different kind of language compared to Tibetan language. So one of the you know, important aspects of this text is that every now and then Sahibhadita would remind the reader that many of aspects of the Sanskrit linguistics particularly linguistics and grammar, don't apply to Tibetan because Tibetan language is different from Sanskrit. So this is, and then in the second chapter, exposition, he takes primarily uh, Aspacharya Rasubhadu's uh, main text as a model for explaining the norms of exposition and rules of explanation and commentary of tradition. And in the third, he establishes the rules of debate. So this is a major text, and Kenju really needs to be studied by anyone who pretends to be a Tibetan scholar. Okay, I mean, if you don't know Kenju, you know, to be honest, you cannot claim scholar, you know, mastery of the Tibetan literary tradition. It's as simple as this is a foundational text, and of course, you know, earlier than this and later, Sajjan did not take my explicit. Grammar, grammatical text, there is a text called uh, Dala Chupa on grammar, and Dai Dora Chupa, uh, collection of grammar, and then uh, Ligijo, composition of letters. But this is one area where Tibetan, subsequent Tibetan scholars, including even among Sajjan tradition, they did not follow Sajjan literature. And this is one of the reasons why I currently our grammar is a bit of a mess. But if you look at poetics and other aspects of like the and the synonyms and, and the 
in this major lecture and uh, uh, poetics, the Tibetan tradition forms a method that does need completely, and we have developed a very sophisticated, fully functioning tradition. But a grammar, Sujubai and Tanjuba became the dominant model, and Sagya Pandita's grammar was not that influential. And because of that, our grammar to this day is not complete. And so we, we should uh, you know, pay heed to Sagya Pandita's constant reminder that Sanskrit is a different kind of language. The Tibetans should have their own grammar. So this, I think, is a really important text. Can I have the next one? So these are some of the main texts. I just, and of course, I think there are quite a lot, but among the great masters of Tibetan uh, tradition, um, if you look at the collected writings, I think the collected writings is not the largest. He has only five volumes. Pudun has 26. Tsongkhapa has 19, okay? And Shakya Chodhan has something like 25. So, Sakya Pandita's collection of texts is not that big. But what he has in those five volumes, pretty much every single one of them is like a gem. So these are some of the main texts. He wrote three texts, three treasuries. So the first one is a uh, kinship that I talked about. So treasury of wise saying is a like Treasury of words is the Uinju Engine, Treasury of reasoning is the Brahmana text, which he called the Sagittism was talking about. And on Brahma, he wrote a short text for Galajupa. There's another one by Navartava and Yigi Jola. And then on metrics, it's interesting. Sagittism says that the Sanskrit metric system does not really apply to Tibetans because it's a different kind of language. But because the Tibetans are so enamored by Sanskrit literature, and because we want to have a mastery of the Sanskrit literature, my knowing Sanskrit metrics is crucial. So he actually wrote a text of Petro, uh, Petro Natro, and then he wrote this treatise on music, which is one of his early texts. And then differentiation of the three vowels, which it's all in the Sanitism talk, uh, talked about, and also Sahya uh, the, the Venerable also mentioned that. This is a hugely influential text, but it was also one of the most controversial texts, because, you know, in Tibetan we have a saying, Upo Shapo. So, you know, some, somebody, somebody gets, you know, bump on their head, somebody, somebody gets kicked on their legs. So Sahya Pandita had composed this from some Radhya, and his motivation was very sincere. He basically wanted to examine every tradition and lineage of Buddhism that was flourishing in Tibet, sutra, tantra, instructions. And he wanted to examine them, whether they are authentic, what are their origins, who are the great masters. And in the process, he was critical of certain aspects so which then caused a little bit of stir, but he was very sincere in this. And then one of his most influential works, and this is the last one actually, Tuba Boksel, elucidated the sages intent. So in fact, when I was compiling the Light of the Classics, which is a 32 large volume text collection, His Holiness and the Dalai Lama explicitly said, make sure Tuba Boksel is in that collection. So we included that, you know, we had it translated uh, by David Jackson. So in fact, in the light of the classics, uh, uh, the, uh, the author of whose work we have the most is really Sagya We have Sagya Leche, we have Rikter, we have Tuba Bonsel, and we have Rupa Tenshi. So those are in the light of the classics as well. Uh, so can I have the next one? So, now one of his interesting things about Sakya Pandita was that he was not shy. I mean, I'm actually right now working on a modern biography of Sakya Pandita. He was brilliant and he also knew he was brilliant. Okay? He knew he was brilliant and he was not shy talking about how he was brilliant. So, this is a poem on an autobiographical poem known as the Five Eyes. So 
I am the linguist. He is talking about grammar. I am the linguist. I am the logician. Among vanquishers of false speech, peerless am I. I am an expert in metrics. I stand alone in poetics and in explaining synonyms, unravel am I. I am a celestial calculation physicist he's talking about the calendar system. And in outright inner scientists, I am a discerning intellect equal by now. Who can this be? The Sakyapa Alam. Other scholars are the mere reflections. Now just look at the Dhabamaya, Togyapa, Maumu, Yetum, Nada. So he was clean. And also he was perfectly kind. You know, at that time, many of the major tests of country has the classroom there, but he would get it well on the hard day. And it was also at that time that the Chinese department was in Tibet. And this was also the time that Tibetan, as the historian said, it was said that the Tibetan tradition, the Tibetan tradition was finally coming of age on its own. And to that point, much of the effort was on translation and bringing in. Now is the time to do something and create your own version. And that's what the Tibetan So when it comes to you know, acknowledging us that there is contribution and his energy and his greatness, I think we need to move beyond our distinct identity as a member of a particular tradition. So I get that to this importance should not be confined to him being one of the five great ones of society tradition. So his importance has to transcend sectarian identity. We as a Tibetan, we need to look at the as the founding father of our literary, poetic, and intellectual tradition. Can I have the last slide? Uh, so, this is a verse from Tsongkhapa, so whose writings are 150 years after Sayyidina's death. He says, Dharma Master, unrivaled on this earth, magistrate, unimpeded, all things of the world, but neither who has mastered all five signs. He was a sole refuge of the land of souls. He was an exaggerator. So Papa truly met him. So Papa knew the means that the world was a hand that it's not the tradition of the five signs, which has been well established, came to the well established. And so he, that's what Papa says, studying the better tradition. And then I'm not looking at the negative, I'm generating the subject. He was a woman.
which is a, is a contemporary boy. Yeah. Saki had to travel slowly, he teaches along the way, and only arriving late in 1246. Saba met with him uh, only in early 1247, so he's going to have a chance to talk with him in order to allow him to be granted to come. For some creative later on, Are you still not afraid? For these reasons, think of the benefit of the teachings of sentient beings. 
They all hold us in high regard, and we are loud. As such, we need not be afraid. But uh, I'd like to just be concluding by knowing that something relatively much more in the course of the Mongols is going to cure the body of the Mongolian uh, grandson of Jesus Khan. Mongolian Buddhist historians also center the life and legacy of Islam in other aspects of their tradition. Here I'm going to cover examples. Like much of the other early leaders of the Sakya school, uh, Sakya Pantata was considered to be an animation of this association helped later on when Jewish historians draw all kinds of interesting connections with their later Gaelic school. Since, of course, Jesus of Papa was a Papa, too, had been an animation of Jewish history. So, too, was the great patron, or who they considered to be a dimension of hers, whom they considered to be an animation of Jewish history. And the Chief Empire itself was often described by the Mongolians as a Jewish history. Sakya Pantata as a Jushri was important for how Mongolians remembered his legacy in terms of their scriptural language and the eventual translation of the Buddhist holy speech into Mongolian. This was because Mongolian Buddhist historians came to consider Sakya Pantata to be a later incarnation of Tony Sabota, who in the 7th century had invented the Tibetan alphabet in order to translate the Buddhist teachings into Tibetan. As one Mongolian historian put it, quote, in earlier times, when Sansakampo was king of the land of the snows, of snows, Tony Sabota, a manifestation of Manjushri, newly developed a way of writing to that. In the same way, in the days of Putin, Manjushri, now manifesting in Sakyamata, developed a new writing, writing system for the Mongols. According to this story, while living in the Mongolian courts, Sakyamata had informed an earlier Mongolian script derived from the Uyghurs. In a widely circulating character, but the Sakyamata was said to have awoken one day from a dream and noticed an elderly woman carrying a wood scraper used for preparing animal hides. It was too flooded like to talk like a poem or a saw, and Sakyamata saw that the direction for his reforms of the Mongolian language. For Mongolian Buddhist historian, Sakyamata's creation of the script and some of his grammatical reforms led to the eventual, and sorry, grammatical reforms of Mongolian, probably not at the time, uh, led to the eventual translation of the entire Kongyur and Tengyur into Mongolian probably many centuries uh, later. Okay, let me see that a little bit and I'll conclude. Yeah. I'd like to briefly mention one final way that Sakyamata helped shape the Mongolian Buddhist tradition uh, very dramatically, according to the this is the widespread use among Mongolian Buddhist historians of the Sakya lecture. You heard Geshe speak about just a moment ago. For Mongolian Buddhist historians, for about three or four centuries, the Sakya lecture was a kind of running commentary on Mongolian political history, actually. In Mongolian Shizu and other types of texts, uh, this work figures very prominently. Uh, especially alongside the work of Karmaji, the Sakya Sakya Lecce was used for generations of Mongolian monastic authors as a way of interpreting the arc of their history and of measuring the moral content of their forefathers. This was especially true when these authors reflect on the complex and often bloody history of the Mongolian Empire, as the sons and grandsons of Chinggis Khan divided up the world and the time began to battle each other. Although this was all the way down to Bushi Khan, Lekta Khan, and others. Let me just read one example and, uh, and then I'll conclude. Uh, this is from the second of the early 20th century history. Quote, Manjushri Sama has written, quote, if one possesses a mind of great conceit, then great suffering follows continually, lies on a strong ego, ego, and so he is worried about the fox and defeated. And so the Russian Tsar, the Russian Tsar, did not listen to his ministers and uh, uh, and was held by the misguided views. He took 100,000 of his troops and went to fight the Mongols. They did battle near Lake Bekal and built the Chinggis Khan to destroy them and turn them into his subjects, and so on. There's literally hundreds of examples. So this appeal to the Sakyamata's uh, to the Sakya lecture continued well into the 20th century as Mongolian Buddhists tried also to make sense of the tumultuous rise of socialism after 1921 and all during the 
liberal state repression enacted against the Holy Buddhist monasteries and monks, which began in earnest in 1947, uh, before the disaster that occurred in Tibet. Even then, as the Mongolian tradition came to a bloody end until its revival after 1990, Sakya Pandita's and Sakya Vichy provided clarity of the violence they were experiencing. Okay, that was the truth here. Just one second. From the point of view of later Buddhist rulers in Inner and East Asia, and from Mongolian Buddhists themselves, Sakya's relationship with it became a framework. For example, from the third Dalai Lama's relationship with Alta Khan, and the two men, Abu Tipe, Abu Tehan, and the Kapara. Later, the great fifth Dalai Lama's relationship with Ushi Khan. And of course, the various Marshi emperors' relationships with many in Tibet, well, all of the Buddhist leaders in Tibet, especially along the frontiers of Alto, uh, and in some cases of Khan. In addition, Sakya Pandita provides a script, as I said, so that the Buddha Bhashma, the Buddha's speech, could eventually come into the Mongolian language. As the founder of the last tradition of Tibet scholasticism on such topics as Abhidharma, Vinaya, Vajrapamita, Majamaka, uh, Seva, grammar projects, and so on, uh, which Sakya Pandita had mastered, Mongols also understood Sakya as being at the root of their last tradition of monastic education, although this really uh, doesn't begin to well after his life. And finally, Sakya's wise Sayings provided a moral guidebook for understanding their bloody imperial past and their more virtuous present and future. Uh, and I'd like to just end with a beautiful praise actually written by the first Pachamama, Lisa Chikikyasin, who was himself considered, at least by Mongols, to have uh, been a later incarnation of Sakya. And here he is summarizing the great contributions of Sakya Pandita to the Mongols. The great holy one of old time, Sakya Pandita, Supreme among all who followed after him, transformed those of other nations who spoke dissimilar languages. The Pandita, Pandita, expert in the five major sciences, was like the moon of the second Buddha, the holy teacher of sentient beings, together with good and demon men, produced an abundance of riches. And their faces appeared as one, in entering the glorious two systems, the spring of the Dharma revealed its full beauty. From the, from the garden grove of the sutras and the tantras, there came beds upon beds of fresh flowers of the teachings and initiations into this vast Mongolian kingdom. Gradually beautifying it, the blessed land, the garden of the Dharma, by which he meets India, thus appeared yet again in another victorious incarnation in Mongolia. So, Tushi Chen, thank you very much.
for the Benton Monastery, uh, murdered many monks, uh, an abbot, and several local rulers. Uh, so he wasn't playing around, actually. Uh, there is a lot of discussion whether that letter was um, is, 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 uh, an actual historical document. Uh, it only appears much later in Tibetan sources. At the same time, as Geshe and I were speaking earlier, it's very much written in the tone of other letters, uh, including the letter that Saki Pandit wrote back to Tibet after he got and uh, to Sakya and also to some of the apparently, and other letters that all emperors were writing at that time, including to the Pope, to the Pope in Europe. Um, these were demands for submission, um, or else profound violence to follow. Um, and so uh, all that I can say perhaps is that the letter matters a lot for how long we understand the Roman tradition in relationship to uh, the Sakya tradition and Sakya Pantata. Respected for Kodan as a student and Sakya Pantata as a master. So we expect some kind of death but the fact is, whether the letter was being sent, they were the one teacher and disciple. And Koten was a grandson of Jesus Khan. And Koten was actually part of the broader royal movement to create an empire and expand it into areas which were not, not, not yet under the subjugation of the Mughal Empire. So one has to take all of that into account when reading that kind of language out uh, uh, the tone of the letter. In the earlier, we were talking about this. Some of the scholars have disputed or questioned the authenticity of the letter that Sadi Pateta writes to the Germans at home, you know, uh, sharing his wisdom of instead of resisting the Mongol force to su submit and accept all of the so that we can protect our culture and faith. Whereas if we resist, it will be futile, it will be destroyed. And that letter has been questioned authenticity. But again, just because it came later, because this letter from Second Pantheta to Tibet turned up only later in Jabal um, Ahmed's history, a uh, history book. So people question this. But if you look at Second Pantheta's own writing, there are other parts of his writings where they are similar tone. So, you know, clearly Sagipatita's primary concern was the protection of Tibet, the Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan culture, from the powerful force of Mongol. And people mustn't forget, just before the 1240 incursion invasion of Tibet by Mongolian Kota's army, Tambu which is an independent kingdom, was totally destroyed, completely wiped out. Tangut was a separate Buddhist kingdom, developed the race, ethnic development, Polish, which is what they called the Minyak. Minyak kingdom was completely erased because they were resisted. So Saman knew this. So when he is writing, he is writing with all of that as a background. Uh, as well as 
what did Prabhupada Papa and Sada manage to achieve for the Tibetan people? I mean, clearly, in the immediate, Sada's relationship with Kodan probably saved thousands of lives, probably hundreds of monasteries. That is a fact. So I think it's important to look at history with a much broader perspective. So, sorry, I'll just add very briefly, I mean, the same logic, if you were to use the same logic, that because the Tibetans were part of a broader global neighborhood project, and therefore they were part of China, you would say today that Iran was part of China, Russia was part of China, right? Uh, Korea is part of China, Indonesia is part of China, uh, Hungary is part of China, so it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's not historical. Thank you. 